Uh, you can open your Bibles there, and we'll be looking at Acts 13 and 14. Our Lord Jesus said when he was on earth, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Powerful words of Jesus telling us that he wants us to have joy. Serving Jesus should be joyful. He wants our joy to be full. And our Lord Jesus also said, the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are, enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Are you taking the wide, easy road of the majority or are you on the narrow road that leads to life? The narrow road is hard. And serving Jesus will be challenging and messy at times. So what we see from Jesus and what we'll see in our passage today is that there is joy and mess in serving Christ. It is joyful and messy. And our lives will reflect that. We'll see that in Saul and Barnabas' first missionary journey here in Acts 13 and 14. There's so much joyful fruit and so much mess. It's going to be harder and better than they expected, like so many things in our lives. I'm sure you can think of something that is harder than you expected and better than you expected. Marriage and parenting would fit that. Singleness would probably fit that. Harder than you expected and better than you expected in so many ways. Life is joyful and life is messy on the narrow road of Christ. This is a big section of text, so we're going to break it up. I want to ask you to go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. We are going to read just the first three verses of Acts 13 to get us started, and then we'll walk through these two chapters. So Acts 13, verses 1 to 3, says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. This is God's word for us this morning. You may be seated. So this section to start the story is the pre-mission prep. We are at the church in Antioch and they send out Barnabas and Saul as missionaries. Now you notice this church was a diverse church. Simeon and Lucius were both probably African. It says Lucius of Cyrene. That was the capital of a Roman North African province. Then we also have Barnabas, who's from the island of Cyprus. We have Saul, a Jew, a Pharisee, and we have Menaean. It says he's a friend of Herod. So this is a very diverse church with even diverse leadership, Jews and Gentiles fellowshipping together. And then out of this church, we see them sending Saul and Barnabas to go out as missionaries to other places. So it's cool that the gospel is now spread so much amongst Gentiles in Acts that a Mixed church of Jews and Gentiles is sending missionaries out to further places. The gospel is advancing. And I hope you noticed in this pre-mission prep that the role of the church and the Holy Spirit in choosing and sending Saul and Barnabas. The church calls and sends missionaries. This wasn't merely some personal, individual vision that Saul and Barnabas had. Oh, we feel like doing this. God spoke to us, so we're going. No, this decision was made in community. The church, through the Holy Spirit, called them out and sent them. God revealed it to others, too, confirming the mission of Saul and Barnabas. I remember when I first went to China the church had such a huge role in sending me, and it was really healthy. They uh, prayed for me, they commissioned me, they financially supported me, and they stayed in contact with me. They sent me care packages across the Pacific Ocean filled with the Reese's peanut butter cups that I needed because <laughs> they didn't have them there. The church was involved. And this also teaches us 
that big decisions are best made in community, not in isolation. And when individuals come to me and tell me that they've been called to a specific ministry, the Lord's told me to do this, I typically ask in response, has your community confirmed that? Do you have people walking with you who can say, yeah, that makes sense. I can see that direction for you. Or yes, I'd like to join you with that. I wanna pray for you in that so that you're not just walking in delusion, which sometimes we do. Sometimes we think God's calling us to something and it's just our own strange idea. It's good to have community helping us in big decisions. Now, they're not gonna make the decisions for you, of course. You've gotta make the decision. But big decisions are best made in community. Do you have community in your life to offer you wisdom in big decisions that you face? I hope that you do. So if you're making all your big decisions in isolation, you might find yourself straying from the narrow road of Jesus. So this is just some of the wisdom we get from the first little pre-mission prep section. The rest of our passage today is the missionary journey of Saul and Barnabas. And scholars think this is about an 18-month journey that they went on. And there's four main stops. So we're going to walk through four stops through chapters 13 and 14. And we're going to start with the first location, mission stop number one, which is Cyprus. This is the island homeland of Barnabas. So let's read verses 4 to 12. And what you're going to see in this is the joy and the mess of serving Christ. You can stay seated for this, but here's verses 4 to 12. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The gospel spreads powerfully in Cyprus. So Saul, who's now using his Roman name, Paul, same guy, he starts in verse 6 by proclaiming the word in the synagogues to the Jews. But then in the town of Paphos, they face this opposition. A magician named Bar-Jesus or Elamos, a, a false prophet, he rises up and it says he's close with this political leader, the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. And so Elamos, the magician, did not want the proconsul hearing about Jesus and possibly putting his faith in Jesus because then I suppose his magician skills wouldn't be as useful he wouldn't have as much influence over the proconsul. And so Elamos is not wanting this gospel to spread, and he opposes Saul or Paul and Barnabas. And so Paul takes Elamos aside, and he tells him, Elamos, God loves you so deeply. You have such a purpose in your life. You are the apple of his eye. You are a treasured creation of the Lord. No, that's not what he said to the magician, was it? That's, that's how we tend to share the gospel with people in the 21st century, and there's nothing untrue in what I said there. But there is a place to call people out of darkness. And what Paul says here is, you're a son of the devil, an enemy of all righteousness. Now, I'm guessing none of you have said that to someone. Jason, is that your technique? They, probably not. That, it's usually not the way to do it. But Paul wasn't wrong here. It says he was filled with the Holy Spirit when he said this. So this is from the Lord. This is true. 
And sometimes you need to be bold and clear with people. And sometimes 21st century evangelism is merely buttering people up in their self-centeredness instead of calling them out of sin and darkness. And we need to call people out of sin and darkness because God loves them. So yes, God loves them. Yes, he has a purpose for them to call them out of sin and darkness into his marvelous light. We see the hand of the Lord in this story making Elamas blind. He blinds this magician. And then through this miraculous blindness, Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, comes to Christ and trusts the Lord. So the gospel is advancing even through the opposition. And you might be thinking, wow, this seems kind of mean. I mean, is this a God of love? He's blinding people? Well, I hope you remember even Paul's conversion back in Acts 9. Jesus appeared to him, and then Paul became blind for three days. So this isn't the first time this has happened. The blindness of the eyes reveals the blindness of their hearts. And so sometimes we need something like that to reveal to us that we are in darkness, that we are blind and walking in blindness. And who knows, maybe for Elamos, we, we don't know the end of the story. We don't know what happens with him, but it does say he'll be blind for a time. It appears he would get his sight back and maybe he will turn to the Lord through this. But if we don't know that we're blind, we'll never pursue true sight. If we don't know that we're spiritually blind or even potentially walking into the arms of the devil, then we'll never walk out of it into the light and loving arms of our Savior. So are you blind? Are you at or near rock bottom? Maybe you're in the blindness of your sin or you're near rock bottom with trials and tribulations or consequences in your life. Well, God can work with you there and God can use the blindness there. It may even be from him. Charles Spurgeon once said, I've learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. So we tend to curse the wave that throws us around, but if the wave leads us to the rock, then we're thankful for God bringing us that wave as it leads us to him. And so if you're here and you're in a trial or you're near rock bottom in your life, I wanna encourage you to see the Lord working in that. And it may be the Lord's grace to pull you out of that darkness and into his arms. You know, most of us who are Christians know what it's like to be blind and to hit rock bottom. We've been there. There was a point in our lives where we realized, my sin's bad. I've been walking against God and I need a savior. And I hope most of you can relate with that feeling and, and, and know, yeah, I, I was blind, but now I see. And, and the Lord has drawn us out of that blindness through seeing that Jesus Christ died for our sins, died that he might open our eyes and grant us forgiveness of sins so we can be with him forever. If you don't know you're blind, you won't see. So wherever you're at, even if you're near rock bottom today, you can turn to Jesus today and see. So the mission's off to an interesting start in this first location in Cyprus. We've got magicians and blindness and conversions. We've got joy and mess. Let's go to our second stop. We're gonna go to some towns in Turkey, towns in what is modern day Turkey. This is from verses 13 to 52. They leave the island of Cyprus, go to modern day Turkey, and go to a number of different towns. And it actually focuses on a town called Antioch, which is different from the Antioch that sent them. I guess they didn't have a lot of great names for places then, but it's like we got Paris, France, and Paris, Texas. There's two names of different things. Same name of two different things. Okay, we're not gonna read this whole section, but I wanna read verses 13 to 16 to see the joy and the mess going on here. So now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. 
Now, we're not going to go through all of Paul's sermon this morning, but the rest of the chapter is, is mostly Paul preaching this message here in the synagogue. And what he does masterfully in the synagogue, the Jewish place of worship, he shows how the Old Testament leads to Christ. In fact, in verse 32, he says, we bring you good news that what God promised to the fathers, meaning the Old Testament fathers that he talked about, Abraham, David, Samuel, that this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. So he says, yeah, you, you, you got your Old Testament heroes, but, but they're all dead. They couldn't save you. And now God has raised Jesus from the dead to fulfill all of that so that you can be saved. And if you look at the whole sermon later, you'll see Paul preaches the same thing that they always preach, the death and resurrection of Jesus. He always comes back to that core truth. That's what we see in Acts. Now, in the response to Paul's preaching, we really get the joy and the mess. So I want to read verses 42 to 52, and you'll see that here. Let's look at verse 42 and forward. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles." For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. He's quoting the Old Testament again there. Verse 48. Clicker ain't working. Okay, there we go. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So you notice right there at the end, they're filled with joy. Again, the joy of the word of the Lord spreading. And we saw that people were so intrigued with Paul's sermon that they begged them for more. Give us more of the word of the Lord. And it says the next Sabbath, the whole town came out to hear the word of the Lord. Wouldn't we all love to see that here? Some people were following them after the meeting. We see how the word of the Lord is unchained. It is spreading powerfully as we've seen throughout Acts. But at the same time, the opposition shows up. It's messy. And the Jewish leaders are filled with jealousy. They argue with Paul. They incite some of the leading women and men of the town to come and oppose Paul and kick him out. But before they're kicked out, we saw in verse 48, many believed and rejoiced. Joy. Verse 49, the gospel spread through the whole region. But then Paul and Barnabas got to go cool part here is it's, it's too late to stop the gospel in the region. The spark of the gospel has ignited into a flame and the wildfire is spreading in the dry and thirsty land. And it doesn't even need Paul and Barnabas anymore. The gospel's going forward and the Jewish leaders are missing out. They're so caught up in their jealousy, their selfishness, their nationalism, that they're missing the move of God right in front of them. So my question for you for this section is, what are you so caught up in that you might be missing the move of the gospel? What are you so caught up in in your life that you might be missing the hand of God working in your heart or working through you to reach others? We saw what it was for the Jewish leaders here. What might it be for you, for us, it's causing us to miss the move of God among us. Well, Paul and Barnabas move on 
And we go to our third stop to start chapter 14, the city of Iconium. And God continues to work here. Look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 14. Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their mind against the brothers. We're seeing a pattern. A great number believes, the gospel spreads more, and opposition comes against them. Down a few verses, it says the city is divided. In verse 5, it says both the Gentiles and the Jews mistreat Paul and Barnabas and want to stone them. So Paul and Barnabas ran away. Sometimes it's just time to move on. Paul and Barnabas, I trust by the leading of the Spirit here, decided not the time to fight, not the time to push back. We're moving on. We got to move on. We've seen them shake the dust off their feet, the previous town, and now it's time to move on. We, we got other places to go with the gospel. And so a question from this third section would be, is there something you need to move on from to open doors for greater service to Christ? This really relates with the previous question is what might be getting in the way of the move of God in your life? Well, maybe there's something you need to move on from that would open doors for you to more powerfully serve Christ. Certainly, if there's a sin in your life, you need to move on from that. You need to repent of that and fight against that. But there could be other distractions in your life that are getting in the way of you serving Christ the way he would like to use you. And now for our fourth and final stop. Paul and Barnabas' journey will go to Lystra and Derby. And this is where it really gets messy. So I want to read chapter 14, verses 8 to 23, to see what happens here in Lystra and then Derby. Great story. Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lycaonian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. We see big time opposition in Lystra for Paul and Barnabas. Paul heals a crippled man and the people badly misunderstand what's going on. You see, there was a legend in Lystra that the Greek gods, Zeus and Hermes, had once come to visit that city and that in the whole city, only one elderly couple welcomed Zeus and Hermes with hospitality. The rest of the city ignored or rejected them. So what did Zeus and Hermes do? They came back and punished the whole city except for that one elderly couple. 
That was the legend in the back of their minds. So Paul and Barnabas show up. Paul does this miracle, and they're thinking, this could be Zeus and Hermes. We don't want to get their punishment. So they start thinking, we're going to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. This could be them. we got to make sure they're welcome. And we have a whole host of confusion and mess. And so Jews from the previous town show up to stir up the confusion and finally fuel the people to stone Paul. They stone him and take him out of the city and leave him for dead. Now you have to catch the irony here because if you look back in Acts, you remember Paul was standing there approving the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7. Paul, the great persecutor of Christians, and now he's being stoned for his faith in Jesus Christ. Now what's interesting here is The people then pray for Paul, and he gets up, and the next day, he goes to Derby and continues preaching the gospel. Sometimes God miraculously heals, and sometimes he doesn't. We talked about this last week. Why does God heal Paul here, but he didn't heal Stephen? Stephen died from his stoning. We just don't know. Remember last week, we trust God in the mystery of life and death. We trust him. We can't give easy answers. Why Paul and not Stephen? But we trust that God had a different purpose for Paul than he did for Stephen. And so Paul and Barnabas keep going. And the next day, Paul's in the next town, probably with bruises on his body from the stones. He's preaching the gospel. They make more disciples in Derby, And the gospel keeps advancing with great joy. The joy and the mess of serving Christ is on display in Acts 13 and 14. I have two other quick observations from the end of chapter 14 that we need to look at here. And the first one is that we see Paul and Barnabas care deeply about the growth of the churches in these towns. Before they return back to their home church, They stop by all the towns they visited, even Lystra where Paul was stoned. He goes back there. And it says that in these towns, they strengthen the disciples, encourage them to continue in their faith, and they appoint elders for the churches. So they want these churches to be healthy and to persevere for the long term. They're not just showing up and doing a big rally and getting a bunch of people to raise their hands and saying, okay, great, got a thousand converts, got to put that on my blog and move on. They didn't have blogs back then, but you get the idea, I think. The mission is to make disciples who make healthy churches. And then they appoint elders at all the churches. And so healthy ministry grows healthy disciples that form healthy churches with healthy elders. I know that's a mouthful, but that's the the process we should see. Healthy ministry grows healthy disciples that form communities, healthy churches, with healthy elders, with leaders. That's the pattern we see in Acts in the New Testament. That's what we see Paul and Barnabas doing. There's a lot of ministries and even missions agencies that miss this point. They almost focus solely on evangelism, and there's no connection to a local church or no pathway to a healthy community with healthy leaders. Here in Acts, we see the centrality of the local church in missions, sending the missionaries and then planting and forming new churches all along the way. And then a second observation from this last section is Paul and Barnabas told the new believers that it's through many tribulations that they will enter the kingdom of God. Serving Christ means many tribulations, or we could call it the mess. They didn't tell the people, oh, life will be easy now. You've trusted Christ. You're going to have smooth sailing. It's going to be a shower of blessings in your life. You're never going to feel sad again. You're never going to question yourself again. You're going to feel good about everything. You're going to have a healthy uh, mental health and physical health. Just good to go. You're a Christian now. No, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. It's a hard, narrow road. So new believers in the room, I hope you know this. Jesus isn't going to make your life easier. And those of you who've walked with Christ a long time, you probably know this. Jesus isn't going to make your life easier. 
because you became a citizen of the kingdom of God. You, you've changed allegiances to where you're not going to fit in in this world so much anymore. In fact, a mark of being a Christian is you're going to be homesick a lot. Not that you can go and buy some acreage and build your forever home here on earth. That's not forever, by the way. But so that you can have a forever home in the kingdom of heaven that will satisfy longings that cannot be satisfied by anything on this earth. So we're going to feel homesick and we're going to have tribulations from not being home on this earth as Christians. And we need to be prepared for that. Paul and Barnabas are preparing their new believers for that. So we've seen a wonderful 18-month journey of Paul and Barnabas in two chapters, four stops. And chapter 14 ends with Paul and Barnabas returning to Antioch, to their home church. In verse 27, it says, when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith with the Gentiles. What a great conclusion to this joyful and messy mission. They go back to their church that sent them and tell them what happened. And this is really cool. This is quite literally what we've been doing. Last week, we had Brandon and Brittany here from Thailand, and they shared the joy and the mess of their time there. And, and quite literally, they're forming healthy churches and helping appoint elders and pastors at those churches, and, and we got to hear a little bit about that. It's a powerful ministry. And today, we, we got to hear a few minutes from Jason and Renee and how they're seeing baptisms. We're kind of living out Acts 13 and 14. It's pretty cool to be a church living on mission, to be a church that wants to raise up and send people out to the furthest ends of the earth to hear the gospel. We get to do that. We're like this Antioch church. That's why some churches take the name Antioch. You maybe there's Antioch churches out there. It's, it's a cool name. We're a part of it. Are you a part of it? Are you a part of this joyful, messy ministry of serving Jesus Christ. And maybe you're like, well, I got the mess part figured out and not the joy. Plenty of mess. And I'd encourage you, if that's you, to look for how God's working in that mess. And maybe there's some things to, to change from that mess. But I also think sometimes for us, with where we're at, it might be no mess very little mess, but also no joy, or very little joy. Because we can put ourselves in a safe bubble that feels good, and most of our days carry on pretty smoothly. There's not much joy in it either. No mess and no joy means no purpose. No mess, no joy means no mission. It means maybe you've strayed from that narrow, messy path and just on a nice, comfortable, wide road which is easy to do here in America sometimes. Church, a faithful Christian is a missional Christian. It doesn't mean you're going to go on an 18-month journey to towns in Turkey, but it does mean you're living with a purpose, and that purpose is to help make disciples of Jesus Christ, the commission that he gave us. A faithful Christian is a purposeful, missional Christian. How does that look for you? I don't know, that's where each one of us may have a little different nuance to that calling. But a faithful Christian is a missional Christian. And it's gonna be messy. If your life ain't messy, you, you've maybe cocooned yourself in a little bubble and you're missing what God might have for you. When I think of joyful, messy ministry, I, I can give so many good examples. <laughs> I think of serving and journey kids sometimes. Not easy, <laughs> but very joyful. I think of foster care and adoption ministry. Not easy to bring kids into your home. It can be very messy. Those of you who have done that know it's messy, but doesn't the joy and purpose outweigh the mess? Yes, it does. It does. So we're on mission. We're making disciples. So don't quit serving Jesus. The joy outweighs the mess. And yeah, people will oppose you and frustrate you sometimes. Sometimes the people you're pouring into the most will turn around and all but throw stones at you. 
The people you most want to know Jesus and you're pouring into will turn around and, and bite the hand that feeds them, so to speak. But don't become numb in your heart and callous to the needs of the world because of the hurts that you've gone through. Don't do everything you can to create a secure little bubble and avoid the mess because it's in that mess that you're gonna find greater joy in serving Christ so many times and we'll bear greater fruit. So church, I hope the journey will be a joyful and messy church as we get joyful and messy people here from all our different spheres of life. And I hope that your road of serving Christ will be messy, but full of a joy that outweighs that mess. And that's better than having no joy and no mess. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for these powerful stories in Acts 13 and 14 and how uh, you spread the gospel uh, through Paul and Barnabas, but ultimately through your Holy Spirit moving in them and moving in the churches there. And we thank you even for the conversion of Sergius Paulus and, and so many others. And Lord, we pray that we would see more of that. And I pray that you would help us as believers to uh, embrace the messiness of serving you uh, and to pursue joy in serving you over our own security. And Lord, I pray for those who are deep in the mess right now. And I pray that uh, you would grant them joy to see purpose in it. Uh, and ultimately, Lord, we wanna see uh, healthy churches, healthy disciples, healthy leaders. And so I pray that you'd use us to help uh, raise them up uh, here at The Journey and for other churches in our area. We, we pray that you would do that and we would see good fruit of the gospel spreading unchained uh, here in Central Texas and from here to so many places beyond. So I pray that you'd use us in that. Help us to embrace the mess and to experience the joy. So we love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.